to this service where we've gathered to honour, to reflect upon and to ultimately say goodbye to George Brooke Johnson. On behalf of Brooke's family, thank you for your support at this time and especially today. It takes a special kind of person to be a captain, to lead others, keep their spirits up to get the best out of them and to bring the best out in them. Brooke was a captain and he was the right man for the job. In fact, people who served with him said he was the best captain ever. We're going to begin this service with a eulogy to Brooke and I'll invite Glyn, Brooke's cousin, to come and read that for us now. Thank you, Glyn. George Brooke Lindley was born on the 3rd of December 1940 in Morley Hall, a maternity home near Leeds in the West Riding of Yorkshire, England. World War II had just commenced. It was a bleak period with food rations and air, air raid blackouts, a lifestyle so different from what we experience here today. Brooke's name came from his father, George Lindley, and his father's brother, Brooke Lindley. But our family always called him Brooke, or more usually, Brookie. Brooke's father was away in the army, and Brooke and his mother, Elsie, lived with his mother's parents our grandparents. When Brooke was about 10, his parents divorced and they both remarried after a short period of time, his mother to a gentleman called Ralph Johnson, who was the owner of a drapery shop where his mother and my mother worked. Soon after, his father-in-law legally adopted Brooke and his name was changed by deep Paul to Johnson. Brooke had no brothers, but he has a half-sister on his father's side, Alison, who lives in England. Brooke's mother and my mother were sisters, but whilst he was my cousin, he was more of a brother to me, the brother I didn't have. I always looked up to him, and admired his achievements. He greatly influenced my life. We had common interests, football, that's the round code ball, soccer, Tetley's beer, the famous Yorkshire beer, golf and tennis, both which he regularly played with his wife Anne and I occasionally joined them for golf. Brooks' schooling began at age four and a half at Victoria Road Infant School in Morley, and then it progressed from seven to 11 at Peel Street Junior School, where at the end of that, when he was 11 years old, he took the dreaded 11 plus examinations that all school children had to take. And that is a career-defining moment. It's like the OP scores of today. Brooke fared well in the 11-plus exam results, 
and he was awarded a scholarship to Batley Grammar School and it was considered to be one of the best in the area. So our Brookie was no dim sin. During his time at Batley Grammar School, he joined the Army Cadets at age 14. He wanted to join the Sea Cadets, but the choice was either the Air Force or the Army. His father-in-law, Ralph, was an ex-Royal Naval officer, and he became secretary of the Morley Rugby Union Football Club. Brooke went along with him to those matches, and he used to sell or rent out cushions so that people could have a comfortable seat on the wooden benches. He later played three or four matches of, for their third and fourth rugby teams. I remember an occasion when we were together with our grandmother and her saying, our Glyn is six, our Brookie is two sixes, and I'm 66. I'll always stick in my memory. So I always remember my grandmother was 60 years old. I recall sword fights with our grandfather's sword bayonet that he was given in the First World War. Brooke always had the sword, seniority brings privileges, whilst I had to make do with the sheath. At 16, Brooke commenced his naval career by attending the School of Navigation at Warsash near Southampton in South England. Brooks spent over 40 years at sea, swiftly rising through the ranks of mate, fourth mate, third, second, first mate, mate to captain. A capacity in which he served on oil supply ships, general cargo ships and cruise ships. His first voyage was on a ship called the Atayo. It was a cadet training ship owned by the New Zealand Shipping Company, which voyaged out to Australia and New Zealand. And he, he remember he brought me back a boomerang from that first trip. I guess if I'd have been a girl, it might have been a koala. He also told me tales of the places he visited, which inspired my desire to travel. On a passenger ship, called the MV Motor Vessel Rangitoto to Australia and New Zealand. He met a beautiful young passenger named Anne Forster, whom he later married at the age of 25. Not only once, but twice. I'll let Al explain. <laughs> the first time occasion was a registrar office to, uh, for, for taxation purposes. Brooke was just about to go on a voyage and it was tax benefit to him to be married before that voyage. So when, uh, when, the re when Brooke returned, then there was a formal wedding, if it was a wedding. I understand the, the wording of the vows were changed to reflect their already marital status. And it was referred to as a marriage blessing. Brooke and Anne lived in England for a while, where they had their children, Neil and Caroline, who are here today, before emigrating to Australia and moving into a house at 408 Nursery Road, only about three or 400 metres down the road from here. Brooke and Anne have four grandchildren, Crystal, Clinton, Joshua and Carissa, all of whom are here today. In 2001, I went to Singapore. Arriving around 8 p.m. local time, I was waiting with a couple of guys for the hotel courtesy bus. When it didn't turn up, we shared a taxi to the hotel. They both turned out to be ship's captains. 
and both knew Brooke. And from our conversation, I learned that he was well respected as a ship's captain. Brooke, you will be sadly missed, but you will not be forgotten. Rest in peace. Hello. Okay, today we remember my dad for the wonderful, loving, caring man he was. I can honestly say that of all the memories I have of my dad, even from a young age, are happy ones. I remember when I was young, my dad would dance, and I would dance to Tina Turner's Nutbutch City Limits. <laughs> He'd swing me in the air, and it was lots of fun. Then he'd come home from sea and I was always so excited to see him. When he got home, he would, we'd all go across the road to the corner store and buy a big bag of wild berries, licorice and chocolate. <laughs> I thought it was great. <laughs> My dad was a patient and loving man and I only ever remember him once getting angry at me when I ran away from home because I thought it'd be fun to do it with my friends. Very silly, I know. <laughs> my dad just loved to spend time with all of his grandchildren. He loved driving them to school and picking them up once a week or so. He would love to sit out the back of their house and on our house on the veranda and have a coffee with us and watch the kangaroos and birds. My dad loved my mum so much. Two weeks ago, he was too sick to go out, so he asked me to buy some flowers for him. It was very sweet. We'll all miss him, my dad. Miss you so much, Dad. I can't imagine my life without you. I love you, Dad. Now, from my mum. My mum's written this, so I'm sort of just... People have done a little bit. I met Brooke on a boat one day out of England on a ship on the Rangitoto. I was off to see the world. I fell in love and one and a half years later I was back in the UK and we got married. Book got a book. Brooke got a job on an oil rig working out of Broome, so he moved to Australia with two young children. He was a wonderful husband, he was ki very kind, loved his family. I miss you so much. Love Anne. From Carissa. I remember Grandpa would sing his phone number and do a dance. As he said it, it was really funny. <laughs> Every time he came over, which was most days, he would have profiteroles and fresh breads or something sweet with us. He never came over empty handed. It's just what my dad liked to do. When he drove us to school, he liked to think he was a Formula One driver. He would have his music playing and would tell us it was traditional English folk songs. It was opera, it was terrible. <laughs> from Josh. I can remember the stories Grandpa told me from when he was a captain. Stories about the place he'd been, the things he'd seen. I will miss him and I will miss his, hearing his stories. From Clinton. I have vivid memories of Grandpa's wonderful stories of sailing and how Mum and Neil were perfect children. <laughs> I will never forget, I will forever try my hardest to remember him for who he was and what a great grandfather and a friend he was. And from Jess, Grandpa, I don't know where to begin, but I want to begin with thank you. Thank you for being the best grandpa I could ever have. It meant so much to me and that you've taken me under your arm um, like your own grandchild. Thank you for all your amazing memories we all got to share with you. For instance, driving us to school and all the interesting stories you would tell us on the way. Thank you for buying French sticks just for me because you knew I liked them. And also for buying us cookies in the morning before school. <laughs> you were always there for us, even dancing and singing your phone number into our heads so that if we needed your help, we could call you. You would have been... You have been and will always be the best grandpa I could ever ask for and I am so grateful that I've got to call you grandpa. So goodbye for now, but not forever, because I know you're safe in heaven looking down on us, telling us to cheer up, loves. <laughs> we will all see you again someday. 
Love you, miss you heaps. Rest in peace, Captain Grandpa. You will never be forgotten. And last but not least, from Tristan. Brooke was an honourable, sweet-hearted, true gentleman. I will never forget his warped, politically incorrect sense of humour. <laughs> that the many laughs we had sitting around, as he called it, excuse my language, the bar of bullshit. <laughs> he loved me like a son. I will see his smiling face again, but for now, I will truly miss him. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline, for your words and for sharing on behalf of so many and all the grandkids who put some words together there. I can't tell you how proud Brooke would have been to be able to hear those words, so thank you so much for doing that. And now I'd love to invite Brooke's granddaughter, Crystal, to come and say a few words as well. Thank you, Crystal. Good afternoon all. I'm Crystal Johnson, the eldest of George Brooke Johnson's grandchildren. Grandpa was a humble and dignified man who never wanted to be the centre of attention. He was selfless and would want all of us today to take consolation among each other and appreciate the memories we had with him. As a child, going to see Grandma and Grandpa was like going on a holiday. It was always full of adventure and excitement. And Grandpa always had something fun planned for me when I came to visit whether it was trekking around Australia to find the best mangoes in the world, or taking me to wildlife parks or exploring the city. Everything we did together was full of adventure and laughter. He took pride in his career and made the most of life and would always do things to make others smile. He was so supportive over my 22 years and I remember he and Grandma would drive to hours just to stand in the rain to support and cheer me on during various sporting activities. I will miss his adventurous stories, his abundance of love, and his genuine warmth, which will continue to envelope my heart as I go through life. His generosity, selfishness, um, selflessness, <laughs> and work ethic are all qualities of his, <laughs> which will carry me to the end of my days. I love you, Grandpa. Thank you so much for everything. I'm going to read a few more tributes. We had plenty come in for Brooke, and that says so much about him just on its own, but I'll do my best to read these for you as well. First of all, from Derek Hudson. May I offer your family my deepest sympathy for your loss, and I'd like to especially wish your mother to know that. Back in his old hometown of Morley, Yorkshire, I'm thinking of her, I was saddened to be told that my oldest mate, George, has died, but I'm grateful that you let me know so that on the day of his funeral, I can have special thoughts of a man for whom I had the highest respect. We've been friends since 1955 and had many enjoyable times in our late teens and our early twenties. Although we met only infrequently as adults, the crack was the same as always. On those occasions when we were teamed up after five years, ten years or whatever, the rapport was there. The old catchphrases were trotted out to great hilarity, although anybody else within earshot would be mystified and probably bored. I enjoyed being involved in long distance in his writing and publishing ventures. And as a journalist myself, I thought his accounts of events involving the two of us way back in the midst of the mid 20s, mid 20th century were pretty accurate, as well as being well phrased. I checked his publisher's website only a couple of weeks ago to see if he'd written anything else apart from his life story and novel. There was, by the way, a brief but favourable review of the autobiography. I really regret that distance prevents me from being with you today, but I'll be there for my oldest mate in spirit. With my condolence and kindest regards, Derek Hudson. And then another now from Peter Tart. 
Caroline, sorry to hear the sad news of your loss. I sailed with your dad on the, forgive me, Oteo, as a cadet in 1958 and 59, and later on the Surrey, when he was, I think, third mate and I was a junior engineer. We met again at the Ateo reunion in Auckland in 2011 and swapped tales about our careers in the intervening years and old shipmates we'd met along the way. Please accept my condolences to you and your family and friends. Peter Tart. And now another that I've just received on my phone. Wow, technology came off for me. And this is from Malcolm Parrott. I much regret that I'll be unable to attend the funeral living in England, but I would much appreciate if you could mention Brooks' participation and allegiance to the Maritime Group International, where he was a staunch participant until he became ill a few years ago. Brooke was also a very old friend of mine and we went to sea on the same day in 1958. I have passed the sad news on to the Durham Association where your dad was a member of the Queensland chapter who will pass it around all of ex-New Zealand shipping company, ex-employees globally. So it will get wide distribution. I note that you've already let Harry Simpson and Peter Tart know who we were also cadets with. That's from Malcolm Parrott. Says so much about Brooke, that so many people that he met so many years ago are thinking about him today. That truly says what a great man he was. And now I'd love to invite Brooke's son, Neil Johnson, to come and say a few words. Thank you, Neil. Hi, everybody. It's nice to see everyone here. My earliest memory was watching television on July 21st, 1969, and Neil Armstrong was walking on the moon. And my father said to me, you have to remember this day, it's a moment in history. I couldn't understand how Neil Armstrong could be on the moon and on television at the same time. I was only two. Basically, at that moment was when I began my wonderment of time and space, thanks to my father. My first memory of Australia was walking off the aeroplane in Brisbane and seeing my father greeting us on the tarmac with a big smile. We were very uh, different people, you know, coming from England to a very hot country, and so it was nice to be greeted with this beautiful smile. As a young boy, I ached for my father's presence. Uh, he was away training to be a sea captain a lot, so I always remember this great excitement when he was coming home. I'd stand by the window and wait for him to, uh, to turn up in a taxi. It was always very, very exciting. To, he'd have a nice little gift for me from overseas. I can never recall a single incident where I resented my father or even spoke ill of him. There was always respect but underlining this was a deep love. He grew up as a happy child, despite coming from a broken home. I know he missed his father terribly, and he ran away to sea to find himself. He found a wife, my mother, and they had many, many great adventures together. He worked hard and he sailed hard, but he was always kind. I had the pleasure once to go on a half billion dollar cruise liner with him. After we repelled pirates with guns, I was able to see how wonderfully he piloted this mammoth ship into dock. This was the day I realized how much talent and respect he had. And I, uh, I guess I loved him a little bit more seeing this. Here's what I learned from him. Being gone, there is nothing left you can say. Everything should be said at the moment. You should never let, let a kind word go unspoken. I've received many condolences from friends and also some, some people would consider my enemies. And it shows in the grand scheme of things that nothing really matters except the goodwill between us humans. My father always had a smile, always had an opinion. 
and always warm my heart with every breath. I cherish every second of the 48 and a half years that I knew him. We never get to say our final goodbyes as perfectly as we wish, but sharing a life, always showing love and respect is the best way to show how we feel. A few of us here were with him when he died. And I know for a fact that he knew he was loved at that moment. As a young boy, I asked my father, how do you build a time machine? He said, one day I'll tell you. What I didn't realize that his whole life, he was answering that question to me. When I look at my sister, my daughter, all his grandchildren, I see his legacy and I hear his voice. I look at his half brother and sister and his wonderful cousin and I see him. I look at my mother and I see his whole life. If I miss him, I look in the mirror and he is there in me. The thing I miss the most is being able to FaceTime him and have his wonderful smiling face answering the phone. I think the one thing that really sums him up as a person was he, were always, he was always wanting to win the lotto. He never did. But he said, if I ever win the lotto, I'm going to take some of that money, obviously give it to the children. I'm going to take a lot of that money, I'm going to go on a big overseas trip. And I'm going to get a, give out $100 bills for everyone randomly, if they're nice. And I think that kind of sums up what type of person he was. Father, you will always be cherished, and you'll always be missed. I love you greatly, and I'm very proud to be your son. Thank you so much, Neil. Very, very well-loved man was our Brooke. We've taken some time to talk and to hear about Brooke's life. And I know we could talk for a lot longer, but let's take a moment to reflect upon his life in pictures. I direct you to look at the screen and look at the photos of Brooke. Hey, life so well lived and such a rich life. Well, 
Just before we conclude the service, we'd like to create an opportunity for anyone that would like to, to come forward to say a personal farewell to Brooke. Some of you may say a quiet goodbye, others may say nothing. Um, others may say a few words before returning to your seats and others, and it's okay if you'd just like to stay where you are and quiet, quietly reflect or say goodbye in your own way. So now, beginning with Brooke's immediate family, I'd like to invite you, if you'd like, to come forward to say goodbye before we close. extend uh, an invitation and reminder that you're all welcome to gather with the family to continue to celebrate Brooke's life at 6 La Senda Court in Springwood after the service. And now before we conclude, let's take a moment to reflect through the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we also have forgiven our trespasses. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Brooke, you were well loved. You were a gentleman, generous, selfless, trustworthy. You were a man that others wanted to follow, a captain not only of ships but of people. You do anything for anyone, you were patient and slow to anger. You are a wonderful man and you leave behind a legacy of people who treasure the memories that you've left with us. George Brooke Johnson, we love you and we miss you.
Goodbye, Brookie.